record. All right, recording. Yeah, so we're going to record all our meetings just to have them. Uh, I think the last one was recorded too. All right. So this talk's going to be about democratizing machine learning application development. So a lot of the times you hear about democratizing something. Uh, and what does, what does that actually mean? So when I think of like democratizing machine learning, it really means about making machine learning more accessible to other people that don't have the deep knowledge of how to develop neural networks or models or, or developing coding. So having something to democratize makes it more accessible to other people to utilize the power that's underneath it. So this talk is about how can we do that for machine learning applications. So when you think of machine learning applications, there's all these like pipelines, there's training models, there's collecting data, there's using some kind of predictions, there are all these big crazy pipelines you see. And if you type in like machine learning pipeline, you'll get all sorts of images. So it's very complicated process, a lot of different tools involved, a lot of orchestration, a lot of moving parts. It's kind of hard to wrap your head around it. And sometimes not one person can do that all of that, it can't train a model, it can't collect all the data, data engineering, they can't deploy it to production, you have different teams handling different stuff. But sometimes you just wanna be able to kind of visualize your application, see what's going into it. Uh, so what happens a lot of the times in machine learning developer standpoint is they use something called a Jupyter Notebook, which allows you to embed code into like a cell block and then run experiments there. But when you actually want to move away from that notebook and get it to an actual deployed system, they most of the time would copy their code from that notebook, put it into a Python script, and then make some kind of Flask, which is a backend API uh, server that allows you to make web requests to that server and get information back. But once that kind of pipeline set up, uh, they always need new, new features, they need new things, and it comes in this unmentalability trap when you see step season four where you have this backend service that's doing something for the front end and they need more features, they need to refactor this and it becomes harder and harder to kind of maintain that development cycle. And if the, more people need to get involved and it becomes kind of an untainable trap. Another way is people try to do a more waterfall style approach where they'll actually collect requirements. Okay, we need to do this, this, and this. And then they'll lay out the wireframes. You got all this set up. It's gonna look exactly like this. The app should do this when you press a button, and then you code everything up. And then once it's out of production, oh wait, we forgot about this, we forgot about this, we need to help fix this thing, we need to update that, another feature comes in. And if you're gonna start all this again, it kind of just slows down the process and makes it hard to iterate and actually kind of get instant feedback. And also, this also requires, maybe the data science person isn't an HTML engineer or, or JavaScript, and so you need multiple people involved in this process. So this becomes more harder and harder for like to kind of visualize your, your data, visualize your story you're trying to tell for all the moving pieces. So in, that, in those scenarios, you need many different people to kind of develop an application, develop the machine learning, do everything all at once. And it's kind of hard have for a single person to kind of walk through that framework. So what I really want to emphasize is how can we democratize that framework, make it easier? How can I develop a quick app in Python and have a web page that people can interact with and play with to make an actual app and go through my data in a sequential manner? So this new framework I discovered a couple of months ago called Streamlit is an open source framework for machine learning and data science teams and allows you to create beautiful data apps in hours, not weeks, and it's all in Python and it's completely free and open source. Uh, and their workflow is kind of, you just have a Python script, you have something, and you can just put in their cool API calls, and then you have a fully fledged app that can be interactive, you can t do things with it, share it with other people, and it spins up, no worrying about HTML, JavaScript, backend code, you can deploy it as is. And I really liked how you can very quickly iterate and see what's going on with your data and what else you're putting in. So uh, this is a video they have. Uh, are you able to easily embed images, data, put sliders, clean up the UI. 
and it's all within Python. And a lot of data science people already use Python. It's a good language for people that are also learning programming. It's very flexible, it's easy to use. And I'll show a little demo. Uh, let's see. Streamlit. So it's pretty simple. You just run Streamlit run and then your app. And it says go to this URL. Uh, shouldn't have it open. Let's open the editor too. Hello. So here I just have st write hello and it writes hello there. Pretty simple. Uh, I have a pretty big API. I don't know if it's my screen is pretty weird, but Ooh. yeah, ST right. You can even write like LaTeX, which I think is pretty cool. So a lot of people like to do LaTeX statements. Uh, could embed that right into a document. Uh, data frames. You can make tables right there. So and even upload them. So. I'm going to uncomment some code that I already had ready. It's pretty cool. So you can easily upload files right from the actual machine. So I have a data set. Uh, and then what we want to do is actually show our data set. So I'm going to just going to do uh, st.write data. Data is not null. Let's do this. Let's do write data frame. And there, it actually writes the data right there. So I think that's pretty cool to kind of do that exploratory load your data. I want to see what's happening. And then my next function, I have this heat map function, which is kind of pre populated if you want to see a heat map of your data. Uh, so I'm going to. And what I really like about it is like it's interactive. So you can be updating the things as you go. So this data is the, is the Iris data set. So it's a very popular machine learning data set for depend, uh, predicting what type of species flower is based on its uh, the length of uh, different type of petals it has. So here I'm just selecting what I want to use for the axis and I'm able to instantly get feedback on the data. So I think this is a really cool interactive way to visualize your data instead of just having a boring table. You can kind of immediately like play around, see what things are doing and kind of natively explore your data in a different mindset. And it's pretty simple by just writing simple code and having and this can also be deployed anywhere. So it's, it showed like a network address when it's deployed instantly. So I kind of really like that ability to ramp up something up quickly and see what you're doing and then have other people iterate and see how you can interact with your data. I think that's really some of the key ways Streamlit is being used. You can go to their website too. It's a video. So they say the three simple ideas are embrace Python scripting. So everything's in Python. They have those interactions, so the widgets, clicking through things, and it's deployed instantly. So I really liked how it really it looks good on a phone, it looks good on your website. And, it, and they're also gonna offer this team thing so they can kind of manage that, but you can kind of do that already without them managing it. But you just have a way to for data scientists and other people to easily deploy applications and run things. So it's really democratizing that machine learning process. And they have a lot of cool examples in, in their gallery. And I find it's a very powerful framework to kind of integrate into a lot of these different things. So it's all Latex, uh, Plotly, I think that's the heat map, Python, Matplotlib, Panda. So a lot of things are already ready to go with this. And People are posting on Twitter all the time about it. So we should post on Twitter about it as well. Before I go on, any questions about Streamlit? Is this pretty cool? Is this, would you use this? What do you think? Oops.
uh, from a non-technical perspective, that's pretty cool, the heat maps and how you had that, you know, visualizing the data like that. Does this replace Jupyter Notebooks or is it? So, no, so it actually doesn't work in Jupyter Notebooks and I think that's by design. The idea here is you want to develop an application, not a notebook. I want to tell something that somebody can interact with and use and kind of tell a, a story of my data. Here's all the, the iris data from the, the iris data set. I want to see a heat map of the data and I can easily look through and click a couple of buttons to kind of visualize what my data is, what, what's going on. So it's just a way to interact with the data in a non-notebook environment that's more intuitive for an end user. Okay. Right. Is, there, is, is Streamlit providing the, um, the part where you're editing the code or is it just, because I saw that you, when you ran it, you just passed the code, the file with the code into it, right? But is it also helping, helping with the development or the development environment? No, so Streamlit uh, under the underneath it's using something called Tornado, which is a web server. So what Tornado is doing is it's hosting this web page. So I'm going to like localhost 8501. But Streamlit has these cool like ST functions that allow you to do like write the data frame or write hello or whatnot. So all this is just regular Python code, but I'm using these, these Streamlit functions to actually add the interactiveness to it. So that's kind of the main power of it. I can. So this chart I'm making is in Plotly, but I'm having like these select boxes here. So set, have a checkbox, put a select box for the columns in my data frame. So Streamlit's providing that in, uh, interactive layer that normally you wouldn't be able to get in a regular like Python script. If I just ran a Python script, I'm not gonna get these cool drop downs and pick things. Right. And things. Can I ask a, can, this is going to be a real yeah, go ahead. dumb kind of human question. Um, I'm an architect for actual buildings mm -hmm. and I quickly transitioned to what's called construction administration where I was running the actual construction of the building because you could get out of the office mainly. And so, and you get closer to the people who are actually building the built environment. Mm -hmm. The worst thing that ever happened to me is when the client walks in and says, I didn't know it was going to look like this. And I'm like, well, it's too fucking late now. We just spent your $30 million building your building. And what happened is, is that way back at the very beginning, we have a, a, a phase called schematic design where we roll out that we, we try to tell people what we're doing, but because we're trying to be the smartest guys in the room, the client doesn't want to speak up and say, I don't understand. So they don't. And we go ahead and spend their money and build it. And then they say, I didn't think it was going to look like this. And I think that happens in a lot of industries that we're all too smart for our own good. The, those of us, who know how to do the things we do and we're not communicating to the people who we're serving what we're doing. And I think story is where that comes in. We need to be able to tell a story about, you know, that building that looks kind of like, you know, Lord of the Rings. Well, it's kind of like that, but it doesn't really look like that, but it's close. You know, you're going to get this thing or you're going to get that thing. And we need to figure out a way to tell people what we're doing. And so when you put all this code up, I'm wondering who are your clients? You know, are they really the code people in the side or are they the users who are going to interface and they don't understand any of this. They just want it to work. So how do we tell the story? of how we're going to, um, at a human level, tell other people what you're doing at a real highly technical level. I'm writing science fiction, so I'm, I'm dealing with that as well. I have to very quickly explain complex, issues, complex ideas. Right, so that, a lot of the time it comes down to what the client actually wants. So they can say, give you all these requirements. I kind of went over this in the brief that you have 
you have a requirements team said, these are the requirements, these are the wireframes of what I want. I'll go ahead and build something. And when you go ahead and build that thing, they say, oh wait, I actually meant this, I also meant that, I actually want this. So using a framework like Streamlit, you kind of can rapidly prototype. So one of the things in agile software development, you want to have an iterative development cycle. So, and in a data ops environment, you want to be able to tie your data to your actually development cycle. So for a tool like Streamlit, you can actually prototype and quickly rapidly iterate on things and kind of get something client facing quickly. Um, a client doesn't care about machine learning pipeline that's doing something. They want to see how their model is actually predicting, doing things, how it's generating them value. So using something like Streamlit, you can kind of visualize that entire flow. So you can go up to a client and say, here's my pipeline, here's what's happening, here's what it's doing. You want to be able to demonstrate your data story. So using a platform like Streamlit, really helping articulate what is going on, what you, can you do? You can see something. I just don't want to know my, my Jenkins job got kicked off and things are running good. Can I actually see something that's showing value? And I think Streamlit is that platform that's helping demonstrate value, which is very important in the data ops mindset. Because I have a cool data frame here, but what is it actually doing? What can I do with this? I think that's kind of the key issue. How can I articulate what I'm doing and showing value from that? And Streamlit is a way to do that. So there's a company, there are several companies, but there's one in particular, I can't bring up their name, but they're very, very good at creating graphic images of data. Mm -hmm. Of You know, they can do bubble images of bars, they can do moving, in, you know, they're really, really, really good at turning data into visual graphic images and just lately the best version of that was the flatten the curve which mm -hmm. showed the the peak and then how to flatten the curve that was a perfect visualization of the of the problem that we were facing with the hospitals we could not overwhelm the hospitals and uh, some people at first started criticizing that chart because it's like well it's not based on real data but it doesn't matter because it's, it's an abstraction of data. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times you need to be like very specialized graphics people to do that. But I think with a tool like Streamlit, like I'm able to make this cool, nice looking heat map with a couple lines of code. And I think that's also part of that democratization storyline. How can we make it more accessible for people to visualize cool things with data? Yeah. Uh, oh, let me move on. Uh, that's Streamlit. So back on to democratization of machine learning. Uh, so if anyone's familiar with web development, there's a tool called, a framework called Ionic, which is an open source framework that allows you to kind of put in like buttons, sliders, uh, plus signs, loading docs, very, all the things you think of it like a web app or iPhone application, like that they have some kind of built-in thing that allows you to just press a button and it's there already. So it kind of lowers the bar for like web application development or well, machine learning yeah. application. Yeah. Yeah, is this a JavaScript library or what? Yeah, it's a JavaScript language. They support Angular, React, and Vue, but yeah. I use it on the Angular side. But it really helps like, you know, you don't have to, it abstracts away a lot of the things of what, so you can kind of just focus on developing your code and use a couple of buttons like Streamlit to this add in a button or add in a camera angle. So it really just makes it easier to develop yeah. web apps. Mm -hmm. But in the same plan, Streamlit's kind of doing that as well, but you still have to know the code. You still have to write things down. So to still level up, like you have to be skilled at like Python to actually utilize Streamlit in a meaningful way. You can't just be somebody that has no coding skills and utilize like a framework like Streamlit or Ionic. So we kind of really want to take that in a, a no code way. How can like somebody that's not non-technical utilize a platform like Streamlit to help them like tell a story or do some kind of analysis? So I'm proud to announce Grimoire, which is a new open source platform that I've been developing to create interactive data applications without needing to code. So it's your data, your story. It really allows you to use these pre-packaged Streamlit application functions and uh, press a button, you can kind of get something immediately. So I'll show you what it's about. Let's see.
shut down all my Docker images. Should have done that already. Alrighty, so all I have to do is run the script. Good. Cool. Right, it should be up now. Alright, so So I like to think of Grimoire as the Wix of data analysis. You can quickly run predefined workflows or create your own without any code. So demonstrate, we can go to regression model. So here, this is actually using that same iris data set. You can kind of see a heat map uh, or histogram of the data. And then from there, you can actually run a machine learning model instantly without doing any kind of interface and is able to show you what's the most important thing. So in this idea, I want to select a target for your model. So I want to train a model that can understand what attributes can predict the, the petal width of, of an iris flower. And then it kind of shows you like this cool machine learning plot of saying what the how the training data is uh, split up. It uh, gives you a feature importance. So it says pedal length is, pedal length is the most important thing in predicting uh, pedal width. And, then it kind of, and it kind of gives you a, a toy to play around with the model exactly. So you can put in numbers and see what the model would actually predict. So I kind of like that workflow. You can easily put in data and have something that you can actually utilize right away. And that's just one of the use cases there. I go back to home. So this is the actual place where you can actually build your own. So you can call it like test grim, making a test. And then you can kind of put in your own things here. So I want to add a highlight thing. So highlight the rows which are, or you can do a heat map, for example, like heat map. It would put a heat map of where things are the most colored, the highest numbers there. You can put like something that equals equals a number. We say you want to see this methyl length. And we can say like equals 5.1. And I'll highlight that row. So that's a way to visualize your data, play around with it. And you can also add more things. So let's add a 3D plot. Oh, can add a 3D plot. Uh, is, so kind of that same, same thing. Can easily just play around with data, see things. Show the chart. Still running. Oh, 3D chart. There it is. I don't see any data there. We probably oh, because we didn't put good accesses. Well, it's pretty cool interactive and you can also add like some markdown, which is also good if you want to put some actual text there. So just come in and So that's a really way to kind of illustrate everything that's going on. Uh, and there are some cool things there like maps. Uh, entity relationships, line charts, animations. Uh, so when you actually cast it from a regular place, you can actually hit, can upload your own data. It supports CSV, JSON, images. Not everything's 
there's more things that we'll be able to do later, but CSV, JSON are probably the most common ones. Uh, probably have some other files somewhere that look well enough. To, let's see. So this is a data set about some about molecules. So here I want to actually train a model on like water solubility based on so some of these molecules have like molecular weight, number of H bonds, number of rotated out polar surface. So all sorts of random stuff for molecules. And yeah, I want to predict, given all these features, can I predict what the water solubility is of this model of the molecule? And as we see, molecular weight is the most important thing in determining uh, water solubility. And then you kind of have that interface to play around and test what I think the predicted water solubility is. So it's giving you that kind of instant feedback that you can play around with and test things out. And the important part is that you don't have to put any code here. So you're able to kind of bootstrap a lot of this development instantaneously and kind of just do this regression analysis very fast without having to go to the editor, write code down. So it's really embracing that spirit of democratization of machine learning app application development. So I'm able to do machine learning on data sets very quickly and has the ability to do all sorts of extra spells uh, here. So I call them spells because Grimoire, when you think of Grimoire, it's like a magical tomb. So each of these things that it's doing is a spell. So these are all the spells that Grimoire can do. And it's designed for people to add their own spells to it. So it's using Streamlit at the back end to demonstrate everything, but it's really encapsulating all those Streamlit applications and putting it into one framework where you can easily press a button and run that same exact uh, that same exact code without having to actually run the code itself. So that's what I really like about that. It really makes it easier for anybody really to just upload data and kind of show what the data is doing. They can add their own text to it as well. Oops. Oh, any questions? I see some chatting going on. Mm, that's nice. Hmm. What are all those images um, or just those different same Yeah, so this was a, a pair plot. So it's basically taking all the, the data and it's pairing them. So it's the, the length of the sepal versus <coughs> the sepal width. So it's kind of doing like an area chart or scatter plot for each of the <coughs> different data points. Cool. <laughs> Anyone have some interesting data sets that I can use? <laughs> that was part of the question today to have drop in some data sets that we can run on um, using Grimoire to kind of explore it. I've been using this iris data set because it's a pretty standard one, but as I use that molecule one, you can walk through pretty much any kind of data set <coughs> that's in that CSV form and I can kind of play around and test things out and use things instantly without having to write any code. I think that's really the main draw here that I can kind of do my data exploration and make an application and quickly show my results very fast. Are you able to access any of the, uh, like the World Health Organization data sets or any of the coronavirus data sets that are showing, you know, I guess, different types of data? John Hopkins. Yeah. Let's 
systems. Which one is this? So this is the, let's, let's go to the filter one. So uh, you can upload by URL. So just put in the URL and then you can actually get the data. Oh, that's the data that we just got from that. Uh, let's do, I don't know, what's an interesting filter? Do they have any null values in this data set? They do. So this removed all the null values from that data set. So zero, it doesn't have zero Alabama. So there must have been a null data set there. Uh, what else can we do? Um, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. No, it's fine. <laughs> it's okay. Okay. It's, no, no, it's good to this show that we can uh, kind of look through the data. Like we can already look through yeah. things. We saw we moved in all data sets. Uh, let's see. What is the actual thing equal to? Uh, let's see. Confirmed. So what states has the biggest confirmed? So let's do greater than places that is the column is recovered. So show me places that recovered grade is bigger than 50. Oh, messed up there, 50. Anywhere. Most of the places everywhere has greater than 50. Yeah, at this point. Yeah, yeah so, but it's kind of showing you the power. Oh, it does not show. Yeah. yeah. Number two, what was number two in the original data set? Oh, yeah. Oh, NAN, see, has a null value there. So they don't know what, what the thing is. So when that removed null, removed that, so. They can kind of see that you can explore your data, see what's showing, and then kind of plot it later. I don't know what a good way to plot this data is, but you can just play around and see see what happens. <laughs> uh, whoa, what's that? So let's say x-axis would be the state. Uh, Y-axis would be confirmed. C access depths. They can kind of see. Yes, New York definitely has the most. New Jersey second. And it's kind of linear. So this is a way to visualize all that data. And you know, pretty easy, pretty simple. And if I'm writing some kind of blog post or something, I have a way to have an interactive data form right here. Like you can easily look at that data, see what's happening. And you didn't have to do any codes. I think that's kind of the, the key point there, that democratization of having a machine learning application or data application. I can get a URL from that GitHub thing, and I can just filter through things, play around, and I can do all sorts of stuff as well. So I really think that's kind of the power of Grimoire providing. You do that cool data analysis or machine learning without having to type in any code. Any other thoughts? Oops. Keep going. All right. Let me go back to the PowerPoint. So that was a cool demo. You can see all sorts of things, but there's still much more that could be done. Uh, some more spells. So I mentioned how a grimoire is a magical tomb and each of those actions is a spell. So there's so many things that can be done there. Only sort of a very small subset of them, but there, there's even a mapping one in the show, but you can also like map plots on a map. So there's a lot of cool things that you can do and I wanna extend it to do many more use cases instead of just graphing stuff, doing more machine learning model training. This, there's an endless amount of things. I wanna kinda 
put the most prominent spells at the power to the tip of your fingerprint to get easy to press a button and integrate that very quickly. Uh, there's a way to also, I want to have a way to, so people can make their own spells and share them with people. So a lot of the code people write, they're kind of this isolated to their own system. And it would be very awesome if people are going to kind of just share those snippets and have a way to like visualize them and use them in a stream that architecture. So I want to have a library for the actual grimoires and spells that people can just easily share and download and find that kind of same analysis on the data they have. And then I also want to have like a, a pro version which allows like guided user, uh, user interaction. So think of like Wix. I want to have a website and for my company or, or a restaurant or whatever. I don't want to hire a big design firm to do the, the stuff. I just press the button and I have a website ready to go. Same can be said for data analysis or, or having a machine learning application. I don't want to hire a data team. I don't want to hire all these people. I want to kind of go through a guided process where I can kind of do the thing and gain insights of my own and see what's happening. So having the, the grimoires I had were kind of like a demo one. They get us loaded data, show it some graphs. But what's an actual business case for that? What's an actual valuable thing that... Uh, end user client can do. So if I can develop an application that can walk them through that and they can kind of do that stuff on their own and gain value from that, that's kind of the end goal for a platform like Grimoire. Here's some resources. Uh, the Streamlit site, the Grimoire site, on my Twitter. And TUSIC Labs has some positions open. So if anybody <laughs> is interested in some data opposition or DevOps or machine learning, there are definitely jobs that we have and I can gladly talk about that. That's really all I had. So any questions about Grimoire, uh, how I built it, what it's about, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so this would be considered open source? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can go to the website. Mm -hmm. so. <coughs> it is on GitHub. Uh, I developed it using Python and Ionic. So Ionic is the web framework, and then yeah. Streamlit it shows all the grimoires that are actually deployed. Yeah, stream. It's it's Python through Streamlit, right? Yeah. So Streamlit is also open source, and it it provides that kind of this layer here, but you can add in the own. Mm. So yeah. But I I developed a lot of the Streamlit applications and kind of put yeah. them in a push button way, so you can easily just utilize them without having to write the code, and you just upload the data, get the data from a URL, and then continue and just go with it from there. So it really kind of mm -hmm. streamlines that application development process. Mm -hmm. Now this doesn't use any data. Does this use a database like MySQL or something? No, so uh, it's using JSON files. So it's writing stuff internally, but does not right. like write us database or right. MySQL. Kind of want to, I didn't want to have all these extra dependencies. I kind of wanted to keep it self-contained. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's everything is run through Docker, so you just need Docker yeah. to, to run it. So that's kind of the beauty there. You don't have to download anything. Just as long as you have Docker, you run that run script and then it starts everything off. Wait, so the actual data set is stored in JSON? Yeah. Oh, so okay. what do you mean the data set? Like the data that you're analyzing? No. So the data I'm analyzing, I just got from this, like this URL. This. Okay. Yeah. So that. Oh, so it's, and it's, in that case, it's in CSV. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's just, just a yes. flat file, yeah. Yeah. Now, is there limits on the size? Like, I mean, obviously. Yeah, yeah. So the fault limit's 200 megabits to up for a file. So anything greater than that, it won't work out of the box. You would have to uh, update the mm -hmm. underlying Streamlit server. Which, you mm -hmm. can do that, but just for purposes to try it, you don't want to overwhelm the system. Yeah. 
but it is actually hosted online if you're interested in trying it later as an interactive demo. Mm -hmm. The demo is pretty weak, so I, I, it's not, I'm using a three tier service to host this, but it's there if people want to play with it later without having to download it, but it is there on the website. That's all I had then. No more questions. Yeah. Okay. Is, how, how, how do we? Is there an applaud button or something on Zoom? Uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> there is an actual applause button on Zoom. It should be at the bottom there, next to your record button. If you have one as reactions, then you can applaud, and it shows on my screen. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, I see that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, thank you guys. Thank you, Banjo. It was awesome. Yeah, very well done. Thank you. Yeah, Tom, had you heard of Grimoire before? No, I had not. I no, just I made it up. <laughs> so I developed this. It's it's brand new. Yeah. So I've been working on it. The <laughs> no, past. the name. I was the name Grimoire. Oh wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. The Grimoire is pretty well known in fantasy. Yeah, the science fiction writer knows all about it. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because I, I had to look it up. It looks like it's anime or something. Right. Yeah. I came up with the name as like, when people think of like machine learning, think of like dark magic, like crazy things. So uh -huh, I kind of yeah. want to encapsulate that like, oh, machine learning can be simple. How about a grimoire? And that's kind of where it came from. Yeah. So artificial intelligence is obviously a uh, huge thing in science fiction and usually artificial intelligence going bad. Yes. You know, so. it's, it's an easy, uh, it's an easy bad guy because we're all trying to be politically correct these days. So you can't blame, you know, the Middle East, you can't blame the Russians, you can't blame the Chinese, but artificial <laughs> well, intelligence, that's a great yeah. villain because, you know, it, it has no yeah. ethnicity. No, but it is actually doing some bad things, so some places. <laughs> well, there's that too. Yeah. I, um, I don't know if you've seen Amy Webb's book about the big nine and uh, the mafia, which is Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, <laughs> IBM, and Amazon. Mm. It's called the mafia. <laughs> oh, yeah, they're the big players, all right. Yeah. The fangs, the fangs. And the bat is the three Chinese companies, which I can't name off the top of my Baidu, head. Baidu, Alibaba. Alibaba. And, and Tencent. Tencent, Tencent yeah. So those nine are the bad guys right now. <laughs> mafia bat. <laughs> yeah, the mafia bat. <laughs> Unless you're high. Yeah. 